Okay, it's three o'clock in the afternoon now, so I suggest we get started. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this new edition of our lecture series that we organize here at the Chair International Macroeconomics at the Paris School of Economics. My name is Tobias Bohr. I'm the um, titulaire, as they say in French, of the chair. Somewhat unexpectedly, we had to turn this into an online-only event, but there are transport disruptions and protests here in Paris today that made us a little uncomfortable to have our speaker travel here in person, but I'm not less happy um, to welcome Richard Baldwin, Professor of International Economics at the Graduate Institute in Geneva here online today. He will talk to us about globalization and automation, in particular in the service sector, and what that means for macroeconomics, and in particular, for monetary policy. I'm in the comfortable position today that I don't have to do anything, and that is because Olivier Garnier, Direct Director General at the Banque de France in charge of research and international relations, kindly agreed to chair Richard's lecture. I'd like to thank him personally for that, but I'd also like to thank the institution that he represents for enabling us here at the Paris School to organize events like this. In addition, I'd like to thank my colleague here at PSC, Thierry Verdier, who will discuss Rich's lecture. Um, I'd like to also thank Juan Carluccio at Banque de France, who organized um, much of, of today's meeting and who is my colleague in the steering committee of the chair. And finally, I want to sh I thank our Secretary General, Anya Lefeu, who's hiding behind the PSE PSE tab there, um, who in the absence of any more specialized colleagues uh, organized this webinar as if that's what she did every day. So thanks, thank you very much for that. Before giving the floor to Olivier, um, let me just um, say that after the discussion by Thierry, we will, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and to engage in a, in a standard Q&A. You can do that through the Q&A button that you should all see at the bottom of your screen, or even preferably by raising your hand, at which point, uh, if everything works according to plan, me or Juan will be able to give you the, uh, the floor so you can ask your question in person. Without much further ado, I now hand the microphone to Olivier. Okay, thanks Tobias. And uh, on behalf of the Banque de France, I'm very honored and very glad uh, to welcome uh, Richard Baldwin. So I'm not sure uh, it's necessary to present uh, Richard with uh, so well known and is, uh, as you know, one of the leading experts in the field of uh, international uh, economics. He is, uh, as you know, a professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. And he has also strong links uh, with CEPR. And you know that uh, now Banque de France has also established a partnership with EPR, with uh, CEPR moving uh, to, to Paris. Uh, uh, Richard used to be the, the president and director of CPR until uh, 2018, and he is also, of course, in the, still the editor-in-chief of uh, Vox EU, and uh, many of you, of course, uh, know uh, Vox EU, which is, uh, of course, uh, a, key, uh, a key way to promote uh, economic ideas uh, in, the, in the global, uh, uh, I would say, in the global sphere. So just... Uh, Maybe to, to mention also that we, we had the pleasure uh, in 2018 already uh, to, to welcome uh, Richard for the same kind of uh, lecture. At that time, he, he published a first book uh, in 2016 on the Great Convergence, and we, we, had, uh, uh, we, we could discuss that. And uh, since then, he published a new book in 2019 on uh, Globotics. And, uh, and so uh, I'm sure that he will talk about it because uh, about global X. So I hope that when you publish your next book, we will have also the, the pleasure to, to welcome you in Paris, uh, this time maybe uh, in person. <laughs> uh, I, I guess that uh, when you publish your next book, maybe the, uh, you know, the, the, the reform <laughs> uh, will be implemented maybe <laughs> and, oh, and uh, there will be, uh, it, uh, it will be quieter in Paris uh, streets, but uh, maybe just to, to finish uh, with some final remarks, just to say, I think a, a key, uh, I think in your work, what I find really interesting is that uh, you, you put forward the role of uh, services and especially trade in services. But, uh, you know, as, uh, as you know, at Banque de France, we, we produce also statistics of uh, balance of payments. 
and uh, we 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 know very well that uh, data uh, on services uh, are very difficult both to produce and uh, and also to interpret uh, because uh, then uh, especially now it's very difficult to to locate to interpret the tax issues also and uh, and so i would also like to to have your comments uh, on that on how to use how you use this kind of data and it about the same about uh, price data uh, we we know that uh, compared to uh, the price of goods, the price of services, also the, the data are not that much reliable or subject uh, to interpretation. So I would be also uh, very interested uh, to hearing you uh, on that. So uh, I think it's time to, to give you the floor and just to remind you also that uh, Thierry Verdier, a professor at PSC and who is also a top expert on, in international economics, uh, will be the, the discussant. So Richard, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much for that, Olivier. And let me just start by thanking Tobias and Juan for inviting me and uh, Olivier for chairing and Thierry Verdier in advance for uh, discussing and Anya for arranging all the, uh, all the discussions. Um, I'm tempted to speak a little French just to show you that I can speak French. Mais malheureusement, j'ai un accent suisse incroyable. No, that's that's an exaggeration. So probably it's better if I keep uh, in English. So um, this talk is about globotics and macroeconomics. And it's uh, based on a paper that I wrote for the ECB's uh, Central Banking Forum in Sintra this summer and, and has actually been posted there. It's also an NBR and CPR working paper. I've done a little bit more work uh, on this, uh, especially the service sector trade aspect. And I'll show you a few slides from that. So let me just get started with uh, the word globotics. So globotics is an ugly, but hopefully memorable word that smashes together globalization and robotics. And you can see from that little diagram on the screen, the basic idea is that digital technology is driving automation and globalization of service sector jobs at an incredible pace, in Richard, ways it's coming faster than most think, and in ways that few expect. But unlike the globalization we've been very familiar with uh, before, in the last, say, 25 years, this is affecting white collar and professional jobs and uh, office jobs altogether. So I think the globalization will be very, very different going forward. And I use the word globotics because there's a strong tendency in the globalization literature to talk only about globalization, say trade mm -hmm. in- Richard, so, excuse me yeah. to interrupt you, but I think we can't see your slide. Could you maybe share your screen again? Ah, okay. There we go. Ah, yes. How's that? that, that no, this time it worked. Thank you very yes. much. Okay, good. So, um, Hopefully I painted a word picture that was sufficiently clear to, uh, to, to see. So that little diagram there summarizes what's different about it. And I, I just wanted to, to, to stress that I use the word globotics and I wish people would use it more because there's a strong tendency to separate discussion of globalization and automation as if they were two very different things. And maybe in the case of globalization of manufacturing and automation of manufacturing, maybe they were different things, but right now, Automation and globalization is affecting the white collar and professional jobs at the same time, both at an incredible pace. So I think it's important to talk about them together and that's why I try to keep using this word globotics. Um, okay, so here's the basic idea of how it's got something to do with macroeconomics. Globalization affects the operation of the macroeconomy. And the macroeconomy is the background on which monetary policy has to act. My assertion, something I've been pushing for quite a number of years, is that the nature of globalization has changed radically a couple times in the past, and I believe it will be changing pretty radically going forward. And as a consequence, the way in which globalization is affecting the macroeconomy could change dramatically and thereby change the job and challenges and constraints facing monetary policy. So that's my argument that globotics has something to do with macroeconomics. 
And what I want to do is spend most of my time talking about how globalization has changed. So let's see if I get the, uh... there we go. So three parts, globalization's changing. Second part, services are important but different. And the third part, globotics services and inflation developments, harmonized index of consumer prices. So the last, th last third of the talk, well, it won't be whole third of the talk, will be about the macro stuff. Okay, let's start with globalization is changing. The first message I wanna get across is that goods trade globalization peaked or plateaued around 2008. So here's a picture that many of you will have seen. Please look first at the left panel. So uh, what this is, is world goods trade over world GDP on the left there. And the dark line is in values. So, so the value of world exports over the value of world GDP. The dashed orange line is in volumes. So this is adjusted for price. So it's the uh, world exports in constant prices normalized to uh, 2000, uh, 2015 being 100. And the same for the denominator, the world GDP in, in real terms. So one is the ratio of values and one is ratio of volumes. Now, if you look at either of those, it's pretty clear that the, the ratio peaked in 2008. Uh, when you look at volumes, the decline is less marked and you might even be able to imagine that that's a plateau rather than a decline. But when you look at the values, which is the, what hit, hits the headlines mostly, it's very clearly down, although there's a bit of up and down. Now on the right panel, this is a different way of uh, looking at that ratio. And so what it does is it looks at world goods trade on a value added basis, and it shows it peaked in 2008 as a percent of world GDP. Now the trouble with the standard measure of exports to GDP is that exports are measured on a gross basis and, that, and GDP is measured on a value added basis. And as a consequence, there's some double counting in the exports that can distort the statistics. And what this chart on the right does is remove that double counting by evaluating exports on a value added basis. So let me explain what that is. So first of all, let me just point out that it goes from 95 to 2018, because in order to make this adjustment, you need to have the world input output table. And this is done by the OECD and they've worked it all out for 95 to 2018. So that's where the data is. So now here's the thing about the double counting. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose that Mexico, a Mexican producer of auto parts sources a battery from China. The value of that battery will count in world exports as it goes from China to Mexico. And when me the Mexican producer puts it into a component and then exports it to the United States, its value counts again. So that value has been counted twice. What we do with value added basis is we only count the value added of chi from China to Mexico once, and then we only count the value added that was added in Mexico to the United States. So the, the, the cost of the battery doesn't get counted twice. Now, all that's very exciting and it caused a, a big change in the way a lot of a trade economists think about the world with global value change and stuff, but you can see it doesn't change a thing with the peak. The peak looks very similar to what it is, although it's muted, it's not quite as extreme. So that I, is the first message, world trade and goods peaked. But I wanted to uh, make a few caveats on that. So first of all, beware of false peaks and lazy narratives. So when many journalists or uh, analysts or commentators look at this peak, they declare the end of the neoliberal post-war system. But lots of commentators are saying that, or, or that we're in a post-globalization world or globalization has ended. People spin out a really big narrative about it. And it's very convenient to them that the peak was in 2008, which when the financial crisis came. Uh, so it's very easy to set up a lazy narrative when globalization boomed from, let's say, the late 80s all the way up to 2008, and then it died. But that is not true at all. So these are false. The, the world peak is a false peak. If you look at the 
exports to imports, export plus imports of goods as a percent of GDP for nations, you see that China, which is a very the largest trader in the world now, peaked substantially before 2008. They peaked in 2006 and have been declining very rapidly. The US peaked after 2008 in 2011, and Japan peaked in 2014, and the EU hasn't really peaked. It's kind of stagnating, and we'll look at that more closely. So when people try and tell a global story about that peak, it means they don't understand what's going on. There's actually disparate national stories explaining this behavior, so you have to dig deeper. But I'm not gonna go too deeply into that, but it's just worthwhile alerting you. So here, there's a lot of heterogeneity in this, and what I've done is shown a chart for all the Eurozone area uh, countries um, and all the EU countries. Um, and what this chart does is have going up growth between 2008 and 2020, and growth from 1990 to 2008 on the horizontal axis. So people who are in the southeast quadrant saw growth before 2008 and negative growth after 2008, so we can call them peakers. And you see a few uh, Eurozone and uh, EU countries in there, including uh, France, Germany, Aus Austria, for example, but very little decline. Uh, in the northwest, northeast corner, you see the non-peakers, and that includes the EU 27 average. And you see a lot of big countries like Italy and, and uh, Netherlands. Um, in, in, and you see a few people over here in the, in the other quadrants. But in any case, it's diverse in the, in the euro area. But there are not uh, a ton of people in the peakers, although it does include France and Germany. The next caveat I want to put out is that China is really important in this whole thing. China is so large in the world economy that you always have to make a special case for China. So my argument here in the left uh, chart is that China is becoming a normal mega economy, but with asymmetric supply chain engagements. So let's look at the left chart first. And you can see that red line, that's China. And you can see its imports as exports go up and then decline. So this is basically the same graph as before, but it's not normalized to 2008. Now, what you can see here is that what's unusual about China, and China is now one of the four mega economies in the world, US, Japan, uh, Germany, and China, those are the mega economies, especially when it comes to manufacturing. Its uh, openness ratio was very unusual between say the late 1980s and 2006. And what it's doing now is converging to the openness ratio of the other mega economies. And India is doing the same thing. So basically, this was a development where they imported lots and lots of parts and components, processed them, and then sent them on. But now their industrial base is replacing those imports with locally produced parts and components. So they are, in some sense, deglobalizing. But that has nothing to do with the end of the neoliberal system. It has to do with the fact that China one, they industrialize and now they're getting an enormous industrial base. They're the largest manufacturer in the world now. But it's also worthwhile pointing out that China is not like the US, Germany, and Japan, where it's relatively symmetric on selling intermediates to the world and buying intermediates. China is becoming the OPEC of intermediate industrialized goods for the entire world. And in other work I've done, we and with some co authors, we show that. China, the, the imports of intermediate goods from China accounts for at least 2% of all the intermediate inputs in the manufacturing sector of all the major economies in the world. So in essence, China has really become the workshop of the world, but especially for intermediate goods. But China buying from the rest of the world is declining. So they're disengaging on the buying side, but getting super engaged on the selling side. Now that's not got anything to do with the macroeconomics, but I, I think it's worthwhile raising the flare that that peak has to be handled with great care. The next uh, caveat is beware of deglobalization hype. This peak was mostly commodities and driven by prices. So this chart is gonna be the world goods trade as a share of world GDP by sector from 1980 to 2020. 
So what we have here with the orange line is the total. So this is the value over value. And you can see the peak as we saw before. And what I've done then is take the trade in manufacturing, which is about two thirds of all the trade, the trade in mining and fuels, which is less and trade in agricultural goods. And what you can see is that a very large share of the peak and the rise and fall is in man mining and fuels. In particular, if you do the math, about 60% of the drop in the ratio is due to mining and fuels. So again, if you're trying to tell a story that the entire world system of trade has changed, then you have to explain why a drop in the price of oil, mining and uh, fuels is the end of capitalism or whatever you want to say. So it, it doesn't fit in. Although, of course, 40% of it is in manufacturing. And there you might say that the system really has changed. So let me show you the prices. This is a goods, uh, traded goods prices peak. This is sometimes called the commodity super cycle. We go all the way back to the 50s. The black line is fuels and mining. And you can see it had some peaks before in the 70s and early 80s, which some of us around the table are old enough to remember <laughs> when there were other when there were lines at the gas stations, but because of an uh, uh, OPEC uh, embargo. And then it went down again. And then when the great emerging markets uh, miracle happened, the great convergence is happening, it drove up the price of commodities to a great peak that started falling after 2018. And now, of course, we've seen some ructions. But this price movement accounts for a very large part of the entire movement. And that's why the, the volume ratio was so different than the value ratio, because once you take this price out of there, it's, there's not that much left. But it's still, uh, somewhat, still somewhat important. And so let me end with this simply by saying the peak needs to be handled with care, but there's no ifs, ands, or buts that the ratio is not rising as it used to. So maybe it plateaued, maybe it's going down, but it definitely stopped rising. And that's telling us something important about change of globalization. That's telling us that globalization in the next 10 to 15 years will not look like what we were thinking about over the last 25 years. Okay, next message. Service trade globalization did not peak or even slow. So if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's please distinguish between goods and services when you talk about globalization. There's a strong tendency to ignore services as unimportant. And indeed, when I was in graduate school, we basically assumed all services were non-traded, except perhaps transportation and tourism or something like that. That's not true anymore. And I wanna show you some slides to convince you of that fact and the importance of making that nuance. So here, services trade did not peak. This is for the whole world. And what I'm showing here is cumulative growth in levels of services and goods trade, making the series, these are the values, the, the levels of trade, not the, the ratios. I make those equal to 100 in 1990, so as to see the trend. And as you can see from 1990, other commercial services, which is a big chunk of services, rose 11 times. The goods, on the other hand, rose only five times. And if you look at the graph, this big change has really uh, been going on at least since the mid, the, the big divergence has been going on at least since the uh, uh, 1990s. So it's not a new thing, but it just has, has been newly observed. Now in the right uh, graph, what I've taken is the other commercial services, the value of other commercial services, over the uh, 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 trade in other commercial services, over all goods and services traded, so the importance of this type of service overall, and you can see it went from 9% in 1990 to 20% in 2020. And it shows no sign whatsoever of slowing down in terms of uh, like slow globalization or plateaus or something like that. Now, other commercial services, <clears throat> as you can see in this note, that's all services, less transportation and travel tourism. So those are two very special type of services that get put into the services account, but they really are um, not trade in the traditional idea that something's made in one country and sold in another. Okay, now this is the same set of 
charts for the euro area 19, just to dial it in for, for Europe. And you can see it's uh, essentially the same pattern as before, services increasing two or three times faster than trading goods, and the ratio rising from 7% to 19%. By the way, Europe, Europe is one of the leading exporters of services worldwide. So it's, Europe has, a, at the moment, a comparative advantage in services. Okay, if you want to see the peaking or not peaking, this is a heterogeneity of all the EU countries. So over here, services grew between 2008 and 2020, so it continues to rise. And here, services grew between 1990 and 2008. And everybody down in this corner were peakers, and there's very few people there. Italy's there, Spain is there, Bulgaria is there, but all the rest are non-peakers, uh, in particular, a uh, bunch of the big countries. Okay, so that was my run through the facts. And the, what I'd like you to take away from that is goods trade peaked, services trade didn't. Now, what I wanna do is spend the next few slides looking at the big picture, why? Why did service goods peak and services didn't? And as uh, Olivier was kind enough to mention my book, The Great Convergence, this came out in 2016, um, I have a theory about globalization, which explains how and why things have changed. So here it is. The theory is that arbitrage drives globalization and that arbitrage is constrained by three costs. Now, what I mean by arbitrage is whenever relative prices differ between countries, there's an opportunity to buy low and sell high. And since they are relative prices, there's always a counter trade where what's expensive in one country is relatively cheap in the other. So it's a two-way buy low, sell high arbitrage which drives goods. One other name for that is comparative advantage. Now, that kind of arbitrage for centuries was mostly done in, in goods. And the trade cost constrained how much was done uh, in this arbitrage on goods. And that's been going on, say, from 1820 or whatever. There's also arbitrage in know-how or technology. And that was constrained by communication costs, which came down in the 1990, around 1990. And the last one is face-to-face -face cost, which constrained arbitrage and labor services. And that's what's coming down now. So I'd like you to think about the, the orange goods as past globalization, the blue as recent globalization with the offshoring and outsourcing of manufacturing, and the green as future globalization, where there'll be arbitrage and labor services, which I like to call telemigration, and it'll affect office workers, not factory workers. Okay, so let me explain. Oops, sorry. Wow, went way very. Hold on, I went to the whole end of the. I pushed uh, end instead of next. See all this good stuff you're going to see? Okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Okay, what I want to do is explain how comparative advantage changed. So this was not a small change in globalization. The, the nature and functioning of comparative advantage changed. So if you look at the first, what I call the first unbundling from 1820 to 1990 or so. Basically, you can think about the world as two, two groups of economies, the G7 economies who are headquarter economies and the emerging markets who are the factory economies. But before 1990, basically they had a high know-how to labor ratio in the G7 economies, which, under, which produced high wages in the G7 economies. And that gave a G7 comparative advantage in the high-tech goods where the know-how advantage more than offset the higher wage. And the same thing went on in the emerging markets where a very low know-how to labor ratio produced low wages, and they had a comparative advantage in the products where their low wages more than offset their technological disadvantage. And what you got was two-way flow in goods. So it was really arbitrage in goods. From 1990 to say about 2008, you got a very different type of arbitrage. The know-how from G7 economies, and actually it's not from the economies because know-how is owned by firms, not by countries. So it was US firms taking, for instance, GM, taking their firm-specific knowledge and bringing it to Mexico to combine it with low wages. So this pipeline is arbitraging the labor to know-how ratio in the G7 economies, which is high, to the emerging markets where it's low. And that changed the, the nature of comparative advantage, especially in manufacturing, 
where we had hybrid comparative advantage. In other words, countries like Poland, Mexico, Thailand, whatever, were producing manufactured goods, especially parts and components, with high tech and low wages. And that made it very hard for workers who had high tech and high wages or low tech and low wages to compete. China, of course, was the big winner in this whole thing. And you got a massive movement of manufacturing to them. So there was one way flow of know-how and two way flows of goods. Now going forward, Digitech is lowering face-to-face -face costs. So labor services are going to be crossing borders more, telemigration, which is basically working from home when home is abroad. Now here, we're back to a very different uh, type of um, arbitrage, and that is the low cost labor in emerging markets is being employed through remote teams in high wage offices, or that's increasingly how it will go. And the first step of this has been to hire workers who are located in the same country, but lower cost regions, who are therefore willing to accept lower wages or at least to expand the, the, the wage pool. So again, the big change between this is what's being arbitraged. And in the third going forward, it's labor services being arbitraged. Okay, let me come on to the uh, second big point of my uh, talk. I'm running out of time, but we'll try and speed up here a little bit. That is services are important, but different. So here's services in the Euro area, it's important. This is services in the Euro Area 19 from 2001 to 2019. These are the service sector jobs. There's, sorry about the misspelling there, is 74% of the jobs are in the service sector. Uh, the GDP is 66% of GDP and the weight in the HICP is 44%. And the, um, yeah. So we'll come to the why the weight in the HICP HICP is so different than GDP. It's very indicative of the importance of intermediates. So here are the trends in terms of those three. The jobs has been rising faster than GDP, which is rising uh, uh, even faster than the, uh, the, the inflation weight. And GDP rose and is sort of plateaued. So the, move, the big movement of GDP from manufacturing and farming into services kind of plateaued around the uh, late 2000s. Now, uh, one key issue or key point that's important to keep in mind about services when you talk about macro in particular is that service automation, like think about chat GTP um, and globalization are happening at the job or task level, not the product level. So if you're a macroeconomist and you're thinking about globalization going back, one of the things you might thought about was imported deflation, where the falling relative price of manufactured goods, for instance, it, it lowered the inflation for a couple decades at a time. So the interesting thing there was that a good from China was entering in France and keeping down the price of the corresponding good in France. But when it comes to services, it's not at a product level. It's not Chinese services competing with French services in France. It's Chinese workers working in French officers offices and therefore bringing down the price indirectly. So the mapping is wrong. In, if you want to go into the macro economy, you have jobs and tasks, which is where all the action's happening. But you're probably going to want to know about product levels and sector levels. So service sector automation varies by job. And there's been a nice... Um, uh, scoring of different occupations by Frey and Osborne. It's a bit long in the tooth now, but it's quite famous. And the service sector globalization is also quite variable across jobs. We, you might call it teleworkability, and that varies by job. A more recent estimate by Dingle and Neumann estimated which jobs could be worked from home. By contrast, good sector globalization and automation was always at the product level, not the job level. Now, given that uh, service automation and globalization, globotics, so to speak, is affecting occupations differently. I think this is a, interest, a, a, a useful thing to look at, which I'll come to in a second, is what I call the globotics diagram, which shows automation and tele automatability and teleworkability by job. But I'm, I've got my slides slightly out of order, so I'm going to move on to a different point for the moment. So the point I'm trying to make here is the future of trade as intermediate services. 
So I was arguing before that intermediate services are important. Now I'm gonna say that the future is in intermediate services. Most of you probably haven't heard that word, intermediate services before. Most trade economists haven't heard about it. Although of course you've heard about intermediate goods. That's what global value chains are all about. So what are intermediate services? This is all the service tasks done in the service sector, manufacturing sector, and primary sector that are not sold directly to customers. For example, tasks done by occupations like bookkeepers, forensic accountants, CV screeners, administrative assistants, online client help staff, graphic designers, copy editors, per, uh, corporate travel agents, software engineers, lawyers checking contracts, analysts writing reports, et cetera. In other words, it's business to business sales of services. So rough in the data, roughly speaking, that corresponds to this other commercial services that I was looking at before, or more narrowly, other business services. But the statistics and services are terrible as Olivier pointed out. Um, one point is that every sector uses intermediate services because every sector, whether it's utilities or manufacturing or hospitals, they all have a back office that processes stuff. And those people are buying intermediate services because most, very few firms do everything themselves now. They'll outsource the payroll, they'll outsource the accounting, they'll outsource the legal, the marketing, et cetera. Now here's one of the new graphs that isn't in the paper. It sort of tells you, um, and this is for traded intermediate services, where they're coming from, which service sector they're coming from, and which, uh, a broader economic sector they're going to. So services, these are the big seven uh, classifications of services trade in the OECD TIVA data set. So wholesale, retail, transportation, and accommodation, that's basically international transportation and tourism and, and, um, and uh, travel. And you can see much of that goes into services, much of it goes into manufacturing, that's the transportation, some into construction and some into agriculture. Now, these are more like what, we're what I've been talking about, professional, scientific, technical, and administrative support. And you can see it mostly gets exported from one country to another into services, but also somewhat in mining, somewhat in manufacturing, somewhat in agriculture. And the same is true for financial and insurance services and information services. So you can kind of see where it's going and get a better picture in your mind that it's not all call centers in, uh, in India. Now what I wanna do is make the argument that the future of trade is in services. And I'm gonna use four facts and a conclusion. So let me read them first and then I'll dig into each fact in a little bit more detail. So the first fact is that barriers to services trade are much higher than barriers to goods trade, often a thousand percent in tariff equivalents. Number two is most barriers to trade in intermediate services are technologically linked, not policy linked. So they're held up by digital technology. Number three is that digital technology is lowering the barriers to intermediate services at an explosive pace and COVID forced an adjustment. Four, the demand for intermediate services is huge in rich nations and the capacity is huge in emerging markets. So this is not a situation where they actually have to build a factory before they export the good. They're already doing it in Bogota and Buenos Aires and all, uh, in Nairobi. There's a whole bunch of people in those countries who already produce intermediate services. So the conclusion is that intermediate service trade will grow much faster than goods trade for the foreseeable future. And as noted, it's already been growing two to three times faster since the mid 2000s. Okay, here's fact one. Barriers to trade and services are much higher than barriers to good. There's been some, econom there's been some econometrics, which I'll let you look at at the, the leisure. Fact two is that most barriers to trade in intermediate services are technological linked, not policy linked. So the, uh, the raw fact is that most service barriers are regulatory, not tariffs, because it's hard to tax services when they cross the border. So if a service sector, let's say, architects in France wanted protection from foreign architects, they wouldn't do it through a tariff or a quota on imports. They would do it by having a regulation that, for example, requires the architect to be certified in France. But the point is, is that architect 
can then hire an Indian architect to design subparts of the building. Or for example, could hire somebody in uh, Ukraine to look through all the possible wall coverings for a particular building and looking at all the different standards. Those intermediate services are not regulated. And so there's no barrier to that. So that point there is there's almost no regulation on intermediate services like back office jobs, copy editing, screening, the CV screening, HR marketing, et cetera. Now, what I wanna argue in this, I don't have to argue very much anymore. Digitech is lowering barriers to intermediate services at an explosive pace. So Digitech is making remote workers less remote. When my book came out in early 2019, I actually had to show people videos of people working from home because especially in Europe and Asia, they couldn't believe that you could actually work from home. We don't have to do that anymore. Everybody knows what it's like to work from home. The second is I showed videos and discussions of AI automating service jobs. And uh, now I don't have to. Chat G G GPT just came out and it's very clear that it's gonna be automating a lot of jobs. But more to the point, machine translation is melting language barriers and the COVID-19 uh, adjust, uh, uh, pushed us to the frontier. I don't know what that adjust is within there. Sorry about that. Okay, fourth fact. Demand is huge in rich nations. If service intermediates are three times more important in the manu than manufacturing intermediates in the overall economy. And for a very simple reason, and this is for the French economy. Service intermediate inputs account for 32% of service sector gross output and 24% of manufacturing gross output. And since services account for 68% of all gross output in France, 30% of the gross output is spent on intermediate services. So this is basically the office and administrative stuff and professional stuff that firms do. If you look at manufacturing, manufacturing intermediates are only 5% in the service sector, 25% in their own sector, but since manufacturing is only 26% of gross output, the demand for inter manufacturer intermediates is only 11% of gross output. So the demand is huge and it's over and it's highly priced. The second fact is supply is huge in the emerging markets. So if you look at the share of jobs by sector in 2018 in the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, Indonesia, China, Korea, South Africa, you see here, these are, are them listed, Mexico's in there too. You see 40 to 45%, 30 to 45% of all their workers are in the business service sector. So these are workers who actually, with some training or some adjustment, or maybe none at all, could actually work in French offices. Okay, so a couple other unexpected facts. I'm gonna, I'm blowing you guys away all the way with the facts, but hopefully we'll post the uh, slides so you can, Look at them in the leisure of your um, of, of what, uh, leisure of your afternoon. So, a couple other unexpected facts about intermediate services. First of all, intermediate inputs are more important in service imports than manufacturing imports. So, this is the intermediates as a share of all imports, services versus manufacturing. This goes back to 1995 up to 2018, and you can see. Intermediates are more important in business services than they are in manufacturing, and it's rising, whereas intermediates in manufacture are not. This is for the whole world. Another fact is that service automation is different than it is for manufacturing. And most people, and most of the econometric studies about automation has been done on uh, uh, steel color robots, not white color robots. For instance, all the work by Asamuglu and Dorn and Hansen and all that sort of stuff, They've been looking mostly at robots in the auto sector, which is, employs a tiny fraction of the workforce. But when you think about white collar robots, computers, the key is that computers acquired new cognitive skills since 2016 due to machine learning. Now these new skills are automating service sector tasks using software robots or white collar robots. RPA is robotic process automation which automates uh, assembly line uh, information processing. We have virtual assistants. You have the big platforms like IBM Watson, Watson scheduling apps. And now you will all see very soon Copilot in all the Microsoft Office uh, products. 
there will be massive AI uh, automating all sorts of tasks. So the question though is what changed? Why is it so different now? And the answer is that the programming of computers changed. So think about thinking fast, thinking slow. When you code a computer, you write computer code, you're thinking slow because it's logical, it's thoughtful, and you can only do it for types of thinking where we know how we are thinking. But there's another type of thinking we do, which is thinking fast, which is unconscious. You can do many things at the same time. It's pretty much effortless, and we do not know how we do it. So for example, when you catch your balance, when you stumble, you have no idea how you did that, but your brain did it instantly. And because you don't know how you did it, you can't teach, you can't write a code for the computer to do it. But machine learning programs computers in a very different way. It programs by taking a whole bunch of structured data and estimating a large nonlinear model to make guesses. So it even a little bit like the way the brain makes the guesses, but it, it, that's why the automation of service sector jobs changed so much when machine learning really got dialed up. So here's the globotics quadrant that I promised you before. So if you look at offshore ability on the uh, vertical axis, this is the Frey Osborne, and you, you look at, no, I'm sorry, this is the Dingle Neumann, offshore ability going up and automate ability. This is the Frey Osborne on the horizontal. You can plot all the different occupations there. Some of them are not at all offshoreable. Some of them are not at all automatable. Some are both. So you see what actually happens in terms of automation and globalization affects the economy at the level of occupations, which are spread across products and across sectors. So when we try and map globotics in the service sector into the macro economy, we're going to need a mapping between jobs and products, especially prices. Okay, so this is the numbers. I'm getting short on time and I wanna to get to the macro. So now let me talk about Globotics and the HICP developments. And let me, um, since, since uh, I've, I've probably put almost everybody to sleep, I can hear half the audience snoring already, but um, let me take a, a slight pause here and tell you the story about this paper. So when they asked me to write this paper, I, I was like, what do they want? What could they possibly want? And so it dialed into me that I could maybe redo the calculations that had been done by, by people like uh, um, Auro and others, which calculated what share of the deflation or low inflation that you saw between 1990 and say 2010, what share of that was due to the falling price of imports that came from low wage countries. And I think actually, Juan, you did a paper on this, didn't you? For France, yeah, okay. So I was gonna try and reproduce the Juan calculation, but for services, right? Services are coming online, they're being imported from low wage countries, probably driving down the price of services. I would get a spreadsheet out, reproduce all the things and we'd be good to go. That was not to be. So I had to do a very quick moon dance and re re remake the paper. But anyways, here's as far as I got. So first of all, a couple points about services and inflation. Service inflation is higher, but less volatile. At least this is a measure, this is from the uh, um, Euro area statistics. And there's a very good reason for that. We call it the Balassa Samuelson effect. The basic idea is that productivity advances slower in services than it does in manufacturing. And manufacturing is traded, but services are not. So when the productivity rise in manufacturing, brings up the wages for the entire economy and globalization doesn't force service wage prices to stay low, you get faster inflation in the service sector than you do in the goods sector. So that's the basic idea. But it's flatter because service prices tend to be tied closer to wages and wages aren't very volatile, whereas goods fluctuate with supply and demand in the product market much more. Okay, so here's the excess inflation by Euro area nations. So if you wanna see, here's where the in services minus industrial goods inflation in indices and in points, you can see most of the countries do have faster inflation in um, services than goods. In fact, all of them do. And uh, many of them are above the, the median, uh, which is 17.5 basis points. 
service sector to look to dig down into the sub indices in the HICP. Uh, they're fairly homogeneous except one standout, which is communication. So if you look, for instance, at transportation, recreation, miscellaneous, at housing, they're all rising more or less at the same path. But communications, which is essentially the, the price of phone calls and stuff like that, has been falling very radically. That won't surprise anybody sitting around the table, but it means that at least one bit of that has to be special cased. Okay, so if we put service inflation in the broader context, we energy and food are still rising faster and energy at least is much more volatile. There you have services, that's all the items, all items less energy and food and industrial goods is, is even lower. So that's the kind of deflationary trend you've been importing. Okay, here's the calculation I would have done and I'm almost done here. Well, this is a calculation I would have liked to have done. So calculating the impact of service sector globalization on domestic prices. So what we're, what the, the goal would be to look at the impact on HICP inflation. And of course that depends upon domestic prices in a, in a relatively automatic way. But also it depends upon import prices in a relative direct way, because when import prices come down, domestic prices tend to come down too. So you have this direct impact of prices on the inflation index and domestic prices on the inflation index. But that's not the end of the story because domestic prices of course are endogenous and the import prices can affect wage formation. For instance, if, if manufacturing goods and food falls, then wage uh, rises may be attenuated and that will then affect the domestic uh, prices. Import prices can affect price cost markups this is just Juan's uh, paper, by the way. So Juan, you, you, you can go to sleep for a little while. I'll, I'll wake you up when we get to the next slide. You, I'm just taking from, from your analysis. But it, imports can, can push down price cost markups. And that, of course, can affect domestic prices. And uh, in today's world, lots and lots of inputs into stuff that's made domestically are actually imported. So if the price of the inputs goes down, that can affect the prices. So these are all the channels you would like to estimate. Now, the key to this whole thing is you need import prices. And when it comes to goods, you have import prices or something similar to import prices that we call unit value indices. Now, why do we have prices on traded goods? They don't actually collect prices. What they do is they, when the good goes through customs, they collect the value of the shipment often broken down quite finely into what's in the container, and a, a unit. Mostly it's kilos, but it could, like for television sets, it would be the number of television sets. So when you have the value of the television sets and you have the number of them, you just divide those and you get something that's like a price. And uh, in, in trade and in macro, people actually call that a price. Uh, and then we have something to work with. So we can see how those prices affect the wage formation, the price cost markups, the cost of inputs, econometrically or, or through simulation. Now the trouble is missing data and mappings. So the big missing thing is there are no import prices in services. There are no import prices in services. It's in a fact that I just could not believe. And I actually called up my friends in the OECD who confirmed it. And in case they were idiots, I called up my friends of the World Bank and they confirmed it. There are none. So the problem is that services don't go through customs. So the people who, it's, it's normally measured by the financial flow matching the service. So when the financial flow happens, it get, gets reported usually to the central bank and they uh, allocate that value against some service sector. Lots of countries are now using surveys of large companies asking how much are you importing, how much you're exporting of services. But in any case, they only ask about values. They don't have a quantity unit. In fact, it's even a little bit hard to figure out what would a quantity look like in services. So they don't do it. And since you don't have import prices, then you can't do inflation. Now you could think about wages being different abroad than at home, but that's not that's the problem of mapping jobs into products into the inflation index. And that mapping we don't have. And, and remember the, the uh, globalization and the automation is affecting jobs which are spread all across the sectors. So it's impact on wage formation, we have no idea. It's effect on price cost markups, probably no idea. And the cost of inputs, no idea. So that was uh, 
my problem. Now, a forward-looking research program. First of all, we need price data. And let me give you a few thoughts on how we might get this price data. So as Olivier mentioned in his introductory remark, people collect prices on domestic services. They have to. Two thirds of the GDP is in services. And if you wanna get real GDP, you need the price of those services or at least how they change over time. So somebody in every single country is somehow coming up with prices on services. So one thing to do as a fallback would be to take the service, domestic service prices, line them up in the trade data and find, let's say the service price movements in country A and the service price movements in country B and impute the domestic service prices to the exports from A to B. So we could kind of invent international trade prices based on domestic prices. So that would be kind of one ad hoc way of going about it, which um, I don't have the patience to do, but may maybe somebody could. The second is you need a mapping between imported services to the domestic sector. And the, if, you, if you look at the, it's, there's the world trade data on services online at the WTO. Anybody can look at it and download it. And the um, categorizations seem like somebody made them up who doesn't care about the impact on the domestic economy. So for instance, you have transit, believe it or not, Russia makes payments to the Ukraine for the transit of their oil through the pipeline to Europe. That's counted as a service. And then all the stuff that the Indian outsourcers are doing in Bangalore, that's counted as a service. And these things can be mashed up in an incredible way. For, for example, Ireland is one of the biggest exporters of services because Apple puts its IP in Ireland and that counts as a service export from Ireland, not from Apple. So in any case, we need uh, to fix the, the, the uh, data. And we, uh, the key points, and here I'm ending, uh, services are important in the HICP, it's 45% of the weight and rising. So the, the impact of imported services on service prices in the Euro area should be a matter of great concern. Service inflation is generally higher, but steadier. That's the Blasa Samuelson effect, but that could also shift with automation of service sectors. Communication services are very different and there's lots of heterogeneity across Euro area members. That was the key points I made for the ECB presentation this summer. So that's it. Thank you for living, learn, uh, listening. I have a bunch of slides for Q&A in case they come up, but I'll stop here and looking forward to what Terry has to say. Okay, thank you, Richard. So I, I give directly the, the floor to Thierry. Thierry. Okay, yes, yeah, so let me just uh, try to share my screen with uh, here my um, discussion. Uh, all right, so I guess, can you say it? Yes. <clears throat> all right, so uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to listen to uh, research talks because they are always provocative and they are always, uh, full of nice stories and narratives that allow us to to keep being uh, waking up uh, after after lunch and not trying to go for a, for a nap too long uh, in any case so uh, I want here to start with so basically the story about what uh, just I'm going to summarize in a couple, two couple of, a couple of slides what what Richard was talking about uh, the first slide here is just taking some of his own graphs from an old paper. Uh, and, and a new little sort of twist in the in the in the recent book about his story on the the the, the first the, the the fact that there is this globotics this third great transformation, which as a third transformation comes after the first one and the second one and the first one is the one where you go from the middle age village where consumption and production are done in the same place to the uh, to the, the the global economy where you start to have trade in the 19th century and the beginning of 20th century and production that occurs in one place and consumption in another place and then after trade costs went down we get to the second wave where we have communication costs going down and we have this fragmentation of how to produce and fragment even the production structure by having those uh, global value chain and, and and offshoring and all those things related to uh, trade, as you said, uh, trade between on one side, uh, the North that sends knowledge and combines with how to produce goods in the South and we export back those things to the Northern markets. 
And we get now to the third uh, unbundling, as you said, that basically you start now to have a reduction in face-to-face -face cost and also cognitive cost. And that materializes itself in terms of trading labor services and moving on on how to design new cognition schemes uh, with, uh, with this Digitech, Digitech world and, and trade in services. So the basic idea here is that essentially we have this great transformation and that this great transformation will occur in services and different from the two previous transformations that's gonna come at the same time through automation and globalization. So the two will come simultaneously while for the first two waves, it came sequentially. And in this digital world, Basically, we're going to have white collar automation and trade in services, what uh, Richard calls uh, tele telemigration. And the main point of his talk is to say that's going to basically occur through intermediate services, uh, trade intermediate services, and those trade in term, uh, tra intermediate services in trade will grow much faster than good trades, which peaked or didn't peak or flattened. But essentially, the whole story now, the big action will be in trade in intermediate services. And the reason for this is because first, uh, in the digit Digitech world, barriers to trade in intermediate services will, will be reduced at an explosive path. And this is based on the sort of what he says in his book, the, 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 the four Digitech laws that govern the Digitech world, which are the Moore's law, the Gilder law, the Metzcraft law, the Valiant's law, each of them basically telling us that in the world with virtual uh, trade and information, essentially things get exponentially large, whether in terms of computer processing power, whether in terms of information power, whether in terms of connectivity power, or whether in terms of how you combine different things to create new things and what Varian calls combinatorial innovation. And the second point is that we're gonna get more and more of those trade in intermediate services because on one hand, we have a huge demand in the North and a huge capacity of providing those services in the South, in the emerging countries. And that on the other hand, we have to be worried that that's gonna have a big impact on our economies because basically services is important share of GDP, much larger than manufacturing and agriculture and intermediate services imports are also important. So at the end of the day, the conclusion from this is that we may expect a huge impact on labor markets, prices, employment, growth, all the kinds of things that macroeconomists and trade people care about. And uh, the second part of uh, Richard's talk is mostly about trying to figure out what are the complications for macroeconomies to understand the implications for price movements, in particular, the measurement problem for inflation with respect to services. Although they are important, uh, they tend to be hard to uh, price because as he said, there's no unit value for technical and physical reasons. Many of the services still are non-traded and will remain non-traded. Housing services, for instance, will remain all the time non-traded or hairdresser services will be all the time non-traded. Uh, and, uh, and the second effect, the second problem is of course that global ticks and services, the entry point is not the product level, but the task and occupation level. And therefore, there's a whole need for a new uh, effort in terms of data collection and the mapping of occupations into product services to assess better the effects on inflation. So that are providing us with a number of thoughts and, and questions that are important. And I'd like to organize my discussion as a, let's say taking different perspectives as a growth economist or as a trade economist, as a political economist. And as, as I'm not a macroeconomist myself, as I put a tentative macroeconomist, okay? All right, so in terms of growth, of course, the most obvious question that comes when we think about this global globotics revolution services is how far it can go in the global economy. And uh, the, the suggestions, of course, behind uh, uh, Richard's talk is that we're gonna be in the world of exponential growth. So explosive, and of course, we might ask, are there constraints that will limit that at least to some extent? 
The first constraint will be, uh, I will say first, the laws of, uh, the fundamental laws, laws of thermodynamics, but no, it's gonna be probably more the laws of quantic physics, which basically tells us that the four Digitech laws that he mentions uh, can be constrained by the fact that we get at some point, we cannot miniaturize too much the ships to the level of the atoms without getting into the laws of quantic physics, which clearly create eventually some, some problems. But nevertheless, we may still have some time to go there before we get to that limit. Probably another constraint which might be more important uh, in the current context is the energy or the environmental constraint. That actually at the end of the day in the virtual world, uh, where are the physical constraints of the virtual world that are suggested by Globotics? And there, uh, I want to just to show up this, this picture of uh, coming up from the International Energy Agency, showing consumption of electricity coming from the Globotics wave. So if you can see that, Denter Center Energy uses is basically 2021 using uh, 220, 30, uh, 300 terawatts. 10 at the power of 12 watts, which is looking like a big number. But in fact, if you compare that to global electricity demand, it's not that big. It's about something like about 1%. Okay, that doesn't look like it's gonna be a, a very significant constraint for us. Unless on top of that, you start to include as well cryptocurrencies, because if you look at the next line, crypto mining energy use, and you see that it's about the same order of magnitude. So you already get to something like two, two or 3% of global final electricity demand, which is not that high, but it's not insignificant. What is more interesting is if you look at the growth rates, the growth rates go like between 10 to 60%. And of course, cryptocurrencies, it goes even larger, of course, because we start from low levels. But then this is growth, and clearly there's a question of uncertainty and there probably growth rates of 50% all the time long create at some point, certainly a question of how to worry about energy consumption with respect to globotics. Now, the other feature is that even if we think that it's still moderate, the moderate effect is global. But in fact, you may have a very high local impact of demand of energy for globotics. For instance, if you think about countries like Highland and Denmark, for them, data center electricity demand in 2021 is about 14% or 7% of total electricity consumption in those places. So it's not insignificant, it can be quite huge. And of course it has macro effects if we start to take that into account. Now, the question about the constraints as a, globe, as a growth theorist will say that actually at the end of the day, the big question about globotics, whether it goes that far and be exponential, is mostly the question of the Bommel cost disease problem. Typically, growth is determined not by what we are good at, but rather by what is essential and yet is hard to substitute and to, to, to replace. And this is what determines essentially how growth rate. So probably because of this, we're not going to get through exponential growth. But at the end of the day, there will always be at some segment at the end of the substitution by robots and whatever we want, one guy that is absolutely essential for make that all happen. And clearly that will limit the, the growth process. Now about growth, of course, the other question that comes up is about productivity growth. And one question that you might ask if you are a growth economist or a macroeconomist, is really Globotics a game changer or is it just a sideshow? And there, of course, you might say, well, it looks like I mean, there will be hands increase in productivity, but then you come as macroeconomists I, from the outside, I think they like a lot of paradoxes. They have the uh, equity premium paradox, they have the whatever paradox, and they have the productivity paradox, which is that, well, we already observed some degree of digitization over the last 20 years, and at the same time, we do observe sort of a slowdown in aggregate productivity. So how we reconcile the fact, the story that my, Richard is telling us at the microeconomic level that we're going to have higher productivity uh, growth. And at the same time, at the aggregate level, we don't seem to observe that. 
And obviously the answer to that is because probably it's gonna be very heterogeneous. So this, I mentioned here, this recent paper by those three economists from the ECB, where they looked at a large sample of European firms and the impact of digitalization on the average firm's productivity growth. They find that the effect is relatively small on average, but of course it's very heterogeneous. Some firms basically tend to be very successful at using digitalization and robotization and other firms are not that well. And basically there's a selection bias issue. And so only the frontier firms make full use of digital technologies and spillovers to other frontier firms. And the second feature about this as well is that we may worry about also the impact of this digitalization process in terms of innovation incentives. Typically you might have what is called by Aguillon, Johns and Johns, a kind of superstar effect of uh, high AI or ICT, which is that said actually only those guys will be successful. So if they are the only ones to be successful, market structure will change dramatically, markups might change dramatically, and as well incentives to overcome those superstars will all be changing. So that will create certainly issues with respect to productivity growth uh, at the aggregate level. Now getting to as a trade economist perspective, the big question there will be probably how will the world economy look like with full global ticks? So take this idea that we are getting what Richard says that over time we have more and more trade in intermediate services, more and more automation and white collar robots in services. Where do we get at in this world? Uh, if you take a, the trade perspective, you might say, well, Digitech basically reduces significantly trade costs in services. This is what Richard is telling us. And on the other hand, robotic automation in services tend to reduce significantly labor inputs in manufacturing and services. So what are the consequences for that, of that from a trade perspective? The impact of, on, on comparative advantage. Essentially, manufacturing location will be less and less depending on labor or productivity comparative advantage, and it's gonna become more local. So we, that might explain what we're gonna get this reshoring wave uh, that we tend to observe in certain types of, uh, of sectors. On the other hand, for services, basically we're gonna get like the effect of perfect migration, which becomes global from emerging countries to rich countries. So at the end of the day, the question of course comes is if that's really what's gonna, gonna happen at the structural level, what will be the labor market uh, consequences, the adjustment in terms of relative wages across countries? And as well, what are the sectors that will be less subject to global ticks? And those sectors definitely were people working there, that will be the people that will enjoy probably the best, the gains from trade in this global ticks uh, globalization process. And that will of course have implications for uh, inequalities in terms of the rents, how they are shared and which, who are the people who get those rents. Now getting to as a political economist uh, perspective, I uh, already alluded to the fact that the gains from trade from that global ticks will be inequally shared. And of course that will create a number of constraints eventually on global ticks itself. A first constraint, which might not be really about the, the sharing of the, of the gains from trade from global ticks in services is simply the fact that Richard alluded to that at some point, he said that, well, you know, when you look at robots, they are very good at doing fast thinking, but no slow thinking. The problem with fast thinking is that you can't explain what you think about. So you can't justify your decisions by saying, hey, I do that because of this and this and this. You have to be slow thinking to explain to people what happens. And also responsibility and accountability can only be based on slow thinking arguments. Fast thinking arguments, people cannot say how reproducible it is, why you do it this way. And that creates, of course, a constraint in terms of how to regulate the use of robotics in many sectors where you think that slow thinking is important uh, to justify the decisions. And that, of course, will have a number of other implications that Richard describes in his book. So I'm not going to go through that, upheavals, reactions, protectionism. One last aspect that seems to me very important in this political economy perspective is the fact that if we still believe that globotics will go at a very, very high speed, the response from the social system point of view and the relatory response will go much less quick. So there's a, 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 a sort of gap between the two and it could create somehow some bifurcation in terms of the political economy constraints on, on, on domestic societies. 
All right, now getting to my last sort of slides as a tentative microeconomist. So to do that, I had to get back to uh, sort of my old uh, macroeconomist textbook uh, and essentially uh, Jordi Galli's textbook on uh, new Keynesian uh, macroeconomics. And, and actually ask myself, well, why would macroeconomists care about globotics? Certainly they will care about globotics because it affects the inflationary process and how macroeconomic policies and monetary policies actually could be affected by this process of globotics. So the way to think about this as a macroeconomist typically is looking at the Phillips curve. And this is why I put this one equation in my, in my discussion, which is the NKP Phillips curve, right? Where as any macroeconomist in that audience certainly know better than I, that inflation is depending on expectation about future inflation, uh, uh, variable summarizing domestic slack, which is this uh, uh, deviation of free or marginal cost compared to the steady state, and eventually other factors that tend to appear uh, independently from the cyclical component of activity. And there, of course, if you think in terms of organizing your thoughts with respect to how globotics will affect macroeconomics, you might say first in terms of measurement issues, which is uh, Richard's point uh, about the measuring the inflation rate. So you have to measure prices, price, prices, variations. And there on top of what uh, Richard is saying that services are hard to measure in terms of prices, even the process itself of globotics might matter for the measurement issues. First, because because of the variant law of the GGTech laws, we're gonna get faster innovations, cycles, quality will change. And we already know how hard it is to measure quality for goods. I can let you think about how it's gonna be hard to measure quality changes uh, for services. Second, also in the digit digitalized world, uh, the pricing strategies of firms is very different than the ones from manufacturing firms for services. Typically platforms, two-sided uh, matching on platforms or, uh, or on digital, digitalized uh, um, locuses basically use very complex price setting strategies. And we can think that actually uh, artificial intelligence and all these deep learning story, uh, mechanisms can help firms designing uh, pricing strategies which are more complex, more sophisticated, bundling products, being dynamics, being uh, dynamical, being customized to particular customers, and also basically also using certain types of mechanisms look, such as putting certain dimensions of the services as free to cross subsidize for other types of services which are not free. So all this will create a number of price setting strategy that will make it even more difficult to, to assess prices of, of services uh, in this uh, globotics, uh, globotics uh, dynamics. Now, getting back to my uh, new Keynesian Phillips curve, you have three terms. So you might ask yourself, how is globotics affecting each of those? On the expectation, term, you might say that globotics can actually infect what microeconomists like to look at, expectation anchoring. So there, actually, I found this paper that was written by two economists, I think actually at the Bank of France, uh, about the effect of assessing uh, policymakers' preferences and credibility by their speeches. But you can really think that if you start to use machine learning at a very high level, then you're gonna increase it tremendously, the capacity for observers to assess in real time, uh, policymakers preferences and credibility and therefore affect the process of expectation anchoring. And probably this will have implications for forward guidance policies by, by central banks. On the last term, you might say that it's basically the argument of, of Richard that actually globotics can shift the Phillips curve eventually over time in a train or eventually simply from time to time in a way which is unrelated to cyclical changes in economic slacks, which might be just like exactly uh, of a one half response to integration of low cost service producers or cheap labor or a continuous declines in ICT technologies that directly fit into, into inflation. Probably more interestingly for macroeconomists, 
the world question will be how globotics might change the slope of the Phillips curve. And then we get in this whole debate in macroeconomics about the flattening of the Phillips curve. How will globotics affect the flattening or not of the Phillips curve? And as we know, this uh, sensitivity of inflation to domestic slack depends on a bunch of parameters in those standard sort of new Keynesian uh, models. The, nominal, the degree of nominal rigidities on prices, whether firms and, 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 and other agents in the economy adjust more or less quickly their prices, uh, the market power of those firms, uh, and so the demand elasticity, also the way firms start to interact strategically, the strategic complementarities between firms, and of course, if actually there are some changes, structural changes in the way uh, firms and, and labor works together, so labor and, and, and good market structures. And there I'd like to finish with looking at what will be the effect of global ticks. So there's the global and ticks. So there is the globalization part and the robotics part. And you might say that at the end of the day, you could make the two to get the, the, the end of the picture. So if you think about globalization, there are many reasons to think that actually they're gonna affect this parameter lambda, right? Uh, more competition, uh, more entry, hard sourcing, offshoring, selection effects, all those kinds of things that trade economists uh, like to associate with competition and globalization. Uh, and what Richard was adding up this idea that you may have telemigration, so actually affecting as well uh, local wage negotiations between firms and workers. Uh, all this is likely, and that's what a bunch of papers written as well by some people from the Bank of France and some people from ECB and other places, suggest that actually it's going to flatten the, the Phillips curve and therefore make it less likely that uh, capacity for central banks to monitor uh, the, the, the economic slack will affect, will affect stabilize inflation or not. Now, if you think about Digitech as such, the robotics part, uh, again, you might have a number of channels through which it can affect this lambda, this, this lambda. First, it can affect the fact that firms can react more quickly to change their prices by having higher capacity to computerize and to compute their optimal prices. They may lower menu, menu cost. They can have faster and more accurate price adjustments. Uh, consumers as well can basically look for better products. So you have reduced market power because search costs by consumers will be reduced. This is what we already know for many platforms in the virtual world competitive entry, but at the same time, you might have the opposite effect that you have more market concentration, this superstar effect where networks and increasing returns related to a connectivity can create dominant positions and therefore increase eventually or changes the incentive to increase markets of firms. So, and at the end, there might be also effects related to the impact of Digitech on job polarizations in the, in the labor market, domestic labor market. So for the Digitech part, probably the answer is less clear. At least in the literature, you have some papers that suggest that going to have a higher lambda, you steepen the Phillips curve and all the papers that tend to say you are going to have a lower lambda, you're going to flatten the, the Phillips curve. So there things will be probably more mixed in terms of the conclusion, at least until, until the, 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 the studies that I mentioned here. Uh, at the end of the day, one question, of course, is that all those studies so far tended to look at the issue of globalization and mostly trading goods. Uh, and Digitech, mostly digit digitalization, robotization, with respect to manufacturing sectors. The question is, if you want to really assess the impact of uh, globotics on the Phillips curve, you will have to have studies looking at the combined effect and whether this combined effect will be positive or negative. There, I don't have any answer to that uh, so far. At least I didn't see anything on that in the literature so far. So at the end of the day, to conclude, I will say that the talk by Richard about this third great transformation, global robotics, uh, is telling us that it's going to come in the service sector. And it has a number of provocative trade, political economy, and macro implications, and definitely important challenges for economic policy. And at the end, this talk was suggesting a number of uh, ideas for how to deal with the challenging issues of measurement and the implementation of those problems with respect to in the inflationary process in, 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 the, in the world economy. So I'm going to, to stop here and I'll, I'll leave it to, to, to the floor. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you, 
Thierry. It was also, it was more than a discussion. It, it raised very important question. I cannot, you know, as a central banker, I cannot resist to what you said about uh, the role of AI to analyze uh, the speech of uh, central bankers. But I was dreaming that maybe it could replace also the, the staff because we could do some kind of reverse engineering instead of, uh, in that case, taking into account this uh, reaction of uh, uh, central bank watchers. We, we could let AI write the speeches <laughs> based on uh, what is uh, you know, in the mind of uh, people reading the speeches. So now I, I, I think I, I give the floor to Tobias and Juan to organize the, the discussion. L let me yeah. suggest yeah. that we first give perhaps Richard yeah. a, a couple of minutes or five to answer directly to the points that Thierry raised. And then we can, and during that time, the um, esteemed members of the audience can uh, think about the questions and already put them in the chat or raise their hands. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you. I mostly I just uh, I was taking notes for what, and I want to see the slide so I can 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 follow up on it. Uh, Thierry mentioned a, a whole series of things that I hadn't thought about, but I wish I had. Um, the electricity consumption I think is really interesting, and and that that there is a I, I've been recently looking at the carbon implications, and it, it, they're they're very un unclear because service sector is less carbon intensive per dollar of GDP than the other sectors. But if this goes to developing countries, though they're more carbon intensive than the G7 countries, mostly because they use less clean electricity. But so it's it's complicated thing. But the electricity usage, I think, was really useful for quantifying it. Uh, and and uh, I, I I have to follow up on that. The um, the uh, responsibility and accountability, social reaction. Faster innovation and in services. So that's one um, that I think it's worth stressing you made. That innovation makes it hard to measure prices because much of the innovation comes in terms of quality. And you know, if you just saw the problems we had in measuring the price of computers, for example, and then they had to do a whole, you know, hedonic regression stuff. And um, and but they had a long time to do that. When it comes to, you know, I mean computers would every two or Couple of years, there'd be a new generation of computers, but this is all the time, and you see you see it in the apps. So, God, goodness only knows how you're going to measure all that stuff. Um, also, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that a lot of the digital service stuff is really a barter transaction, where you get the service for free, but you pay them with the data that then they monetize through marketing. So it doesn't, you know, what is the price in that thing? It's hard to know. So I I, I think that and and. As this picks up, that those problems will be more severe, not less severe. But on the other hand, there's something, this stuff is all on somebody's hard drive somewhere. So it's not like you have to send out people to go and you know look in stores to see what the prices are on the shelves. This is literally on people. So if you pass the right laws to force people to reveal this information, you could get it. But that would probably, I don't know if that's doable, but it's this funny contradiction that somebody has this information, it's just not the government. Um, wage impact, super interesting. I don't, so mostly I, I just think it's interesting. I also like the tension of the superstars in AI. There's been, is you just see it with chat GPT. It looks like there are already two or three firms are going to dominate the whole world and maybe only one. And that's, uh, you know, it's, so we're watching it in slow motion again. And so it, it is interesting to see uh, how, how that works and definitely requires some policy response. But mostly, I just want to say thank you for your things, and I'm looking forward to getting your slides and, and thinking hard about what you said. Thank you very much. And an excellent rendition of my paper, by the way. I probably, probably should have just had you give the paper, and then I comment on your comment. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. There are no so, questions in the yes. audience as of now. So uh, maybe uh, our we have two board, minutes left. So um, we have a couple of minutes left. Here yeah. comes the question. Um, we will try to uh, to put these slides online uh, so that the audience who right now might find all this information a little bit hard to digest has more mm -hmm. time to do that. Um, maybe I, I can quick questions to open it. I mean, one thing is that. Thierry was my advisor, so imagine how I was, I was shaking every time I was entering. 
his office, but it's more like a broad question. I mean, it's really related to aging, as you think, but you know, a lot of people, I mean, you talk about this lazy narr narrative of globalization stopping and so on, and now the new narrative or the new thing to discuss is globalization is stopping because of geopolitical issues, right? So the IMF is talking a lot about that. So have you, I mean, the way you're describing this globalization is much less affected to that, right? But you cannot right. really close the pipeline. But people are talking about, you know, a decoupling between the US and China in technology, and that might over, overlap. Yeah, with yeah. That. So, so I, 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 have, I have done some thinking about that. So yeah. I think it's worthwhile saying that all the great 21st century challenges to trade apply totally differently to services than goods. So, for instance, if you look at the US China uh, trade conflicts, it, it is on goods that they're worried about. It's not on services. Nobody's asking, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs to embargo investment banking services to China. That's just not going to happen. And even if they did, it's a little hard to know how they would do it. Um, so that's one thing. The climate change for, for trade, a lot of climate change has to do with extreme weather, which may knock a port like, say, Singapore. If it knocked Singapore offline for um, six months, that would totally disrupt trading goods, but have almost no effect on trade and services. And then uh, digital disruptions, uh, let's say cyber attacks and things like that, uh, probably would have a much less effect on, on many types of services. So generally speaking, the, all, all these big trends that people are saying is going to shut down globalization affect services significantly less than, than uh, goods. But thank you for pointing that out. So, yeah. I'm I can't see any. Um, oh, there is a question. I'm sorry. Um, by Raymond Garella, who asks, does the combined effect minimize the risks attached to it? Um, let me reinterpret that question uh, a little bit by um, by telling you what you think is the prime challenge for policymakers. Maybe also in terms of the risks that are associated with these. Um, ten trends that you so nicely laid out. So should yeah. we should we bullet more worry for the macroeconomic stabilization, or should we worry about the inequality, or what should we worry about? Okay, let me take those in, in line. So the, I think the big way it's going to affect, and the reason upheaval is the second word in my book that I mentioned. I wrote a book. Um, the uh, is that people will have to change jobs a lot more frequently. Uh, and that will be very disruptive. So the main policy challenge is to help people change jobs. Now, there's absolutely nothing new about that. People have been changing jobs forever. It just might have to be faster. So that's the bad news. We might need more active labor market policy. The good news is these people are going to be switching from one service sector to another service sector. So we won't get the Rust Belt effect that was so disruptive uh, when manufacturing was offshored and, and outsourced. So, and, and the skill sets of service jobs tend to be more overlapping than they do between mining, manufacturing, and then services. Um, so that's the, the, the first thing. The um, second thing is, is I have a different take on, on inequality. I suspect that especially AI will be equalizing because what AI does is make average people a lot more capable. And if ultimately wages are tied to productivity, AI, like ChatGDP, is going to make average writers more productive. And of course, it makes great writers a little more productive, but the relative change will make average people better because AI, machine learning, uh, machine learning trained white collar robots are essentially wisdom in a can, a software that helps nurses be more like doctors. And it helps doctors a little bit, but the increment for the average people is much higher. So I think that AI is going to eventually create a whole set of middle professions between nurses and doctors and between road chiefs and engineers, between draftsmen and architects, et cetera, where the lower middle, middle people will be using AI and doing a lot more of the job at the high end. And that ultimately will be uh, equalizing. Just like mechanization, which went from, say, 1870 to 1970, the mechanization gave more power to people work with their hands therefore made them more productive, therefore made their wages go up faster than it did for people who work with their heads because mechanization didn't do much if you were still using ballpoint pens. 
Well, well, so anyways, I, I think I think the inequality will be will be useful. The, can I, uh, yeah, can, you I, know. can I just react on that? Please. I, I, I tend to agree with you, but there's one aspect which I think is uh, one step ahead, which is the incentives to accumulate human capital. In the particular situation where you have different skills, which are over the ladder, relatively continuous, and where at each level you get a return, a higher, a higher and higher return, uh, you might say, okay, people will have enough incentive to educate themselves, which is costly over some time. Now, when you get with these AI technologies, the steepness of the return across skills is certainly flattened, is exactly your point. But which means at the same time that to get to the top where you are the, four, the, 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 the guy that is able to understand and to screen what chat GPT is telling, you need to spend a lot of time in the slow thinking process, which is not the fast thinking of the, using the chat GPT. And that during all that process, you're not productive on the market because you already have chat GPT telling you the average stuff. But to be able to understand whether the, what chat GPT is telling you is average stuff or it is really new, you have to be uh, passing through this other mechanism, which is without any uh, benefit up to the point where you will be able to evaluate that. And that creates a huge gap in terms of incentives to educate yourself. So you're going to get at the end monks that spend 10 years of their lives doing slow thinking to be able to evaluate very fast thinking chat GPTs because they went through a different mechanism to acquire the information of explaining rather than just associating. And a bunch of people that get more and more stupid because they basically just flatten themselves and just take chat GPT for granted as an helping mechanism for basic information. So then mm -hmm. you're gonna get still this uh, sloping effect and maybe at the long term, some inequalizing uh, features with the top, top, top guys, the monks, and uh, the sort of the average bottom at the, at the at the other hand. Yeah, everything you said makes sense to me. So uh, we should write a science fiction. Uh, yeah, script. definitely. But, but uh, I, mean, I, I realize that because I use ChatGPT for that reason, and exactly the point when it comes to <laughs> 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 You're running another uh, another point on ChatGPT. Final is... question. There's a final question in the chat. Oh, okay. which maybe you okay. can quickly answer sure. by my colleague yeah. Ariel Reshev, who asks uh, whether. Governments, yes. through their yes. control of the internet, can't yes. affect international information flow barriers. Right. Therefore... right. So, so it is true that they, if you if you're willing to go all the way to the Chinese firewall, they can't control these flows. Um, but uh, that that's that would be quite extreme. And I, my, it's my judgment that the political, uh, the body politic, at least in the Western world, will not put up with that degree of control. And uh, so I, I agree with that. It's, it's not absolutely technically impossible to completely separate the two, but the political economy forces that are doing it in say semiconductors or steel or all this other stuff, that's really basically military. And you know, I guess you could say that cybersecurity would go that way. But when it, when it comes to doing you know, copy editing and translation and web, web design, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to me that there'd be the pressure to actually kind of disengage. So I, I thank thanks for the point. I and I, I exact as as so often I exaggerate it to make the point, but um it, it is possible to shut it off, but it's quite extreme. But that, what I was gonna say about chat GDP, I mean the thing is that it was trained on human written language, and they apparently are running out of high quality human written language. And eventually the internet will be filled with chat GPT written language, and therefore it will kind of start feeding on itself. Um, so, by the way, I asked it to write a box column from one of my papers, just giving it the whole paper. It didn't, it wouldn't do it, unfortunately. But if you do it chunk by chunk, it'll write a Vox column. It knows the Vox style, by the way. If you ask it to write in the style of Vox EU, it will do so. <laughs> so with that, let me see the other policy uh, implication, I think, is the... Um, competition policy, and, and Terry alluded it to with the superstars. I think that many of these laws, especially Medcalf's law on networks, leads to hyper concentration. And you've been seeing a number of people writing about the, um, about the responsibility of this stuff, accountability of it. And there I like Terry's point very, very much, is that you can't do accountability fast thinking. You have to think hard about 
what is responsible, who's responsible, where did it come from? And so you actually kind of can't just delegate that to uh, to 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 artificial intelligence. So, but that that the idea of of uh, letting machines make decisions without human involvement, obviously in in the military sphere, there's already an agreement that they should not allow machines to fire weapons without a human being involved. But what about firing workers from companies? Who do you decide to fire? If that's done by an AI, that is that okay too? So I, I think we do need some legislation that's controlling the use of uh, automatic application of, of decisions made by machines. What else? I have more slides if you guys wanna watch the slides. <laughs> Okay, thank you, because I think now it's time to, to conclude and uh, thanks to Richard and to Thierry. It was a, a wonderful uh, discussion with, I think uh, we have uh, many food for thought after this discussion. And uh, despite the fact that uh, it was not in person, I think it was uh, as lively, uh, thanks uh, to, the, uh, uh, to Richard and, uh, and Thierry. Maybe uh, just uh, Tobias, if you could, Tell us when is the next lecture? Yes, in fact, we have a lecture very soon on Monday afternoon by John Hassler from the Institute for International Economic Studies in Stockholm, who will talk to us about climate and climate policy, what we know, don't know, and should do. That's at 4 p.m. on Monday. He will have a shorter lecture, which will be followed by a policy panel together with my colleague here at uh, PSE, Kathleen Schubert, and uh, uh, Jean Pisani Ferry um, from Sciences Po, who will talk about climate, climate policy, and uh, and uh, a lot of science, I believe, too. So please, if you have time, join us for that again. And otherwise, thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon, in particular, of course, to Richard, uh, but also to Thierry and Olivier. Thank Thanks you again. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye. Thank you very much.